The new book on the definite atonement is out from Crossway, titled From Heaven He Came and Sought Her. You contributed a chapter to the book, Pastor John, and some initial reviews are starting to pop up online, and I know you read some of them. Uh, Any initial responses to the book reviews that you've read so far? I've read some of these interviews, uh, I mean these reviews, Tony, and uh, this morning I was reading in 1 John a a very um, common verse opposing definite atonement or limited atonement, and so uh, I thought I'd, I'd throw together these two, my thoughts from my devotions and my response to some of these um, reviews like this. Um, My main response is to encourage people, everybody who's listening to this, anybody who reads the book, reads their Bible, reads the review, whenever you uh, hear somebody make a comment about the death of Christ, be sure that you ask, what do you think that means? In other words, if somebody says, Jesus died for all people, fine, I'm not going to disagree with that until I ask, what do you think that means? So when, when you're in an argument or a conversation with somebody about the extent or the effectiveness of the atonement, don't, don't um, smash each other with slogans. <laughs> it's useless just to keep saying, he did die for everybody, he didn't die for everybody, he did die for everybody, he didn't die. Well, that's just useless. You've got to stop and say, what do you mean when you say he died for everybody? The controversy around this doctrine, it seems to me, perhaps more than any other, starts spinning its wheels on the ice, getting nowhere because people are quoting verses to each other without asking, now what do you, what do you think that means? So for example, I was listening to my father preach last Sunday. He's been in heaven for six years, and I've got numerous recordings of his preaching. I love to listen to my dad preach. So he's preaching a sermon called The Secrets of Spiritual Power. My wife and I are listening uh, at a bed and breakfast where we were celebrating our 45th wedding anniversary. And he suddenly stopped and said, do you believe Jesus died for everyone? Aren't you glad Jesus died for everyone? <laughs> I just loved it. And, uh, and we looked at each other, Noel and I looked at each other. The next thing out of his mouth was this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Should have him. So immediately, I know exactly what my father's thinking. He's thinking Jesus died for everyone in the sense that everyone who believes will be saved, which is exactly what I believe. <laughs> and my father wouldn't, wouldn't have called himself a Calvinist, and he wouldn't have called himself a believer in definite atonement. But at that point, at that point, my father tipped his hand perfectly, just as he ought to, what he meant by the term, he died for everyone. He quoted John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes. So what's the meaning then of his statement? The meaning of his statement is Christ died for everyone such that everyone who believes will be saved. It's clear as day. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that statement. Nothing unbiblical about it. John 3.16 means what it says, and we ought to believe that Jesus died for all in that sense. And I think, Tony, that's what 99% of the people in the world who say Jesus died for everyone mean by it. So the question isn't whether that's true or not. The question is, did he do more than die so that everyone who believes may experience the benefits of his death? Because the answer to that is clearly everyone who believes will experience the benefits of his death. Did he do more than that? And that's where my devotions come in from this morning. I was reading in 1 John 2, and I read this sentence. He is the propitiation. Jesus is the propitiation. That is the the one who removes the wrath of God, who assuages the wrath of God, who who absorbs the condemnation that God is going to pour out on on sin unto destruction. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 
Now that's that's a verse that is usually quoted back to those like me who believe in definite atonement or limited atonement say see he's not only the propitiation for our sins but for the sins of the whole world so he removed the wrath of the whole world and I think I should just stop at that point and say okay let's just pause here I want to make sure I understand what you believe that means I hear the words I want to know what you think it means what what do you what are you saying when you quote that at me what what do you think it means now Here's what I think it means, and I'm just amazed at at how John helps us here, because in his gospel, in his epistle, and in the book of Revelation, all written by John, he addresses the same issue in, in words that are similar to help us not misunderstand what he means. So if you go to John 11, 51 and 52, where he's addressing the same issue of the death of Jesus and the extent of it, here's what Caiaphas, who's speaking prophetically, says, and John reports it. Um, Jesus will not die for the nation only, that is the Jews only, but also, now just pause there and hear the similarity. So 1 John 2, 2, He's the propitiation not for ours only, our sins only, but also. And here in John 11:52, he will die not for the nation only, but also. And then instead of saying for the whole world or whatever, he says, but so that he would gather into one the children of God scattered abroad. So not for the nation only will he die. He will die to gather into one the children of God that are scattered abroad. Now that means the death of Jesus procures, obtains, gathers in, receives, accomplishes the ingathering of God's elect, the, the scattered children of God all over the world. So I think that would be the natural way to take First John 2, that when it says he died not he uh, was the propitiation not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. He means the world is included here. This is not a private religion. He didn't just deal with us. He is dealing with the whole world, and he's gathering people into Christianity from the whole world, and he's blessing the whole world by obtaining people from every tribe and tongue and people and language, which is exactly what Revelation, the third text, 5 9 says, You were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and people and nation. So he, he ransomed them from, he's gathering the children of God from by the death of Jesus, which means there is something more God does in the death of Christ than simply making it possible for everybody to believe, a la John 3 16. Rather, it says he is actually effectively purchasing, purchasing them from the tribes, and he's gathering them like children from the tribes. And so it's not only our little precious gospel. It is a gospel for the, for the whole world. Now, the point of all that, Tony, is just to say this. When people read reviews, when they read the controversy, be sure to ask, what do you mean when you say, Jesus died for all. Thank you, Pastor John, and thank you for listening to this podcast. Tomorrow, we look at a question faced by many young, budding leaders in the local church. Until then, please email your questions to us at askpastorjohn at desiringgod.org. You can visit us online at desiringgod.org to find thousands of books, articles, sermons, and other resources from John Piper, all free of charge. I'm your host, Tony Ranke. Thanks for listening.